Ten-year-old vanished while out hunting with his granddad and what has happened is shocking. Wyatt Eves Nibbert from West Virginia had gone out squirrel hunting with his granddad on the 9th of September. Wyatt and his granddad were apparently eating lunch and Wyatt said he was going off to look for some squirrels. His granddad apparently remained where he was and tidied up. He then called out for the boy and apparently Wyatt never came. The granddad couldn't find him and then an hour after the boy had gone missing, police responded to a vehicle accident involving the granddad. Tragically, the boy was found dead days after this. He was found deceased with a single gunshot wound. Police have not yet stated whether they suspect foul play. I have been sentenced to 198 years because I killed my pregnant wife. arrested and I pretended that my wife was threatening to kill me and that I tried to wrest the gun from her hands accidentally shooting her twice while doing so but my lie didn't hold up for long because investigators discovered an audio recording of our argument in which she could be heard pleading with me not to kill her followed by the two gunshots I was then sentenced to 99 years for the murder of my wife and 99 years for the murder of my baby totaling 198 years what do you think about my story I unplugged my hospital roommate's respiratory device because the noise was bothering me too much. One evening, when I was 72 years old, I was trying to sleep, but a sound was haunting me and preventing me from sleeping. It was the sound of my 79-year-old roommate's respiratory device. I had already informed the nurses that this noise was greatly disturbing me, but they reminded me of how important it was for my neighbor. So, I made a radical decision. I waited went into her room discreetly and unplugged her respiratory device without thinking. Then I went back to bed and slept peacefully. Very quickly, a nurse realized what I had done, and the 79-year-old woman had to be resuscitated and still requires intensive care. Thanks to surveillance cameras and my complaint to the nurses about the noise her respiratory device was making, investigators quickly understood that it was me. I admitted to unplugging it, and I am now charged with attempted murder and placed in provisional detention. What punishment do you think I deserve? Could you have done the same thing? I need you to tell me if this footage is proof of ghosts. So the other day, Reddit user Gabriflasm posted this seemingly innocuous footage to Reddit. They said their mom had been recording some security footage because their brother was being intimidated by like a local rooster. She wanted to see if she could catch it on camera. Mind you, this is all happening in the Washington Mountains of Oklahoma. But she texted the footage to the Reddit user because she thought she saw something. And I cover a lot of dark stuff on this page, but I've never seen anything like this. So at this point, the Reddit user's brother is in the trunk, but watch behind the car. It's hard to tell what it is, but here is a closer version. To me, it looks like someone is walking through the woods and then comes over to the car, bends down, and then vanishes. And right after the head goes down, the brother just kind of sticks his head out of the trunk, closes it, and then walks back in the house, and there's no more footage after that. A lot of people have guesses as to what it could be, including a ghost, but most people want the user to go over to where the person bent down and see if they can find anything there. But what do you think? I was killed to death by my own dog while walking in the forest, pregnant. My name is Elisa Pilarski, and I was 29 years old at the time of the incident. On November 16, 2019, I decided to go for a walk in the forest with my beloved dog, Curtis, an American Pit Bull Terrier. While I was six months pregnant and Curtis was not on a leash, I started to lose sight of him, but I wasn't worried as he was used to walking here. I tried to catch up as best as I could, calling for him, but when he came back, I didn't recognize him. He attacked me and began to bite. I tried to defend myself, but I couldn't match his strength. My lifeless body was found in the forest, my baby died, and I succumbed to the deep bites inflicted by my boyfriend's dog. Initially investigators thought it was an attack by a hunting dog, but after examining my body, they realized it was Curtis. My boyfriend has been indicted for involuntary manslaughter as he was the owner of our dog. 
Currently, our dog is placed in a kennel awaiting a legal decision. What do you think my dog deserves? These are videos humans were never meant to see. Okay, so we all know how John F. Kennedy got assassinated, right? But have you actually seen the real footage of the assassination happening? If not, I'm about to show you it. This video is absolutely insane and I cannot imagine being his wife. Jackie Kennedy was literally right next to her husband as his head got exploded by a bullet with his brains landing all over her lap. So without further ado, here's the video. So yeah, you can see JFK gets shot first here, and then he slumps over but he can't fully go down because of his back brace, resulting in the second bullet hitting him in the head killing him. And you really have to respect what Jackie did here. Even after witnessing her husband getting shot, she still gets up and tries to help the secret service guy on the car. I ended my mother's life in the worst possible way. My name is Isabella Guzman, and I lived with my mother, Yunmi Hoy, and my stepfather in Colorado. Since I was a little girl, I was very much loved, even though I was rebellious and constantly argued with my mother. Everything was like that until 2013. I had a very loud argument with my mother, during which I even spat in her face. I was very angry with my mother, so much so that I sent her a threatening email. My mother, out of fear, called the police, and my biological father, who talked to me and managed to calm me down. Or so they thought. That evening, when my mother came home from work and went to the bathroom, I went in after her and closed the door. I stabbed her 78 times until she died. My stepfather came into the bathroom after hearing the screams and saw blood coming out. But he couldn't get in, so he called the police. When I heard that, I left the bathroom and ran. But unfortunately, I was caught the next day. I wasn't sentenced to prison because I was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and now I'm in a psychiatric center. These are facts that can 100% save your life one day, part one. Up first, if you're ever getting chased by wasps, whatever you do, do not go in water to escape them. They will just wait for you to resurface from the water. So just run as fast and far away as you can. Next up, if a service dog comes up to you randomly, you better follow it because it's probably leading you back to its owner who needs help. Next up, the more vivid and colorful an animal is, odds are it's extremely poisonous. So whatever you do, stop your temptations to touch any colorful creature. Next up, if your hair just starts standing up on its own randomly, odds are you're about to be struck by lightning. And the only thing you can do is run, so you better do that. Next, if you're ever in a falling elevator, lay flat on your back on the floor so the force is distributed evenly. I hope I'm never in this situation, but I'm definitely going to do this now if I ever am. This next one might be one of the most helpful ones ever. Every single railroad crossing has a number on them, so if your car ever gets stuck on the track, you just call this number, and they will notify the train to stop. If people knew about this who got stuck on tracks, there definitely would have been a different outcome. Finally, if you ever feel like you're about to throw up, just start humming to yourself because it's nearly impossible to gag while you're humming. These are facts that can 100% save your life one day, part 1. Up first, if you're ever getting chased by wasps, whatever you do, do not go in water to escape them. They would just wait for you to resurface from the water. So just run as fast and far away as you can. Next up, if a service dog comes up to you randomly, you better follow it because it's probably leading you back to its owner who needs help. Next up, the more vivid and colorful an animal is, odds are it's extremely poisonous. So whatever you do, stop your temptations to touch any colorful creature. Next up, if your hair just starts standing up on its own randomly, odds are you're about to be struck by lightning. And the only thing you can do is run, so you better do that. Next, if you're ever in a falling elevator, lay flat on your back on the floor so the force is distributed evenly. I hope I'm never in this situation, but I'm definitely going to do this now if I ever am. This next one might be one of the most helpful ones ever. Every single railroad crossing has a number on them, so if your car ever gets stuck on the track, you just call this number, and they will notify the train to stop. If people knew about this who got stuck on tracks, there definitely would have been a different outcome. 
Finally, if you ever feel like you're about to throw up, just start humming to yourself because it's nearly impossible to gag while you're humming. These are the scariest Japanese urban legends, part three. This is Hachisaku-sama, also known as the eight foot tall woman. And she's definitely the scariest Japanese urban legend ever. She takes the form of an impossibly tall woman with a very deep voice. And she loves preying on children from the ages of nine to 11. She wears a white dress with a white hat and no shoes. Hachisaku-sama stalks her victims for days before catching them, and sometimes up to months. But no matter what, if she's stalking you, you're dead 100%, because there is no way to escape Hachisaku-sama. Her main powers are teleportation and invincibility. So whatever you do, if you see Hachisaku-sama, just try and run. This is Kuchisakiyona, also known as the Slip-Mouthed Woman. She's a very dangerous demonic Japanese spirit. She is recognized by her horrible slip mouth that is covered by a doctor's mask. This happened because her samurai husband found out she was cheating. He slit her mouth with his sword so she wouldn't be pretty anymore. She then died and now roams the earth as a vengeful spirit. She hides behind walls and bushes to stalk students after school. She then goes up to one of the students and asks if she's pretty. If the student replies no, she will immediately kill them with her huge scissors. But if the student said yes, she would take off her surgical mask and ask again. If the student then says no, she would then cut them in half. But if they say yes, she would then cut their face just like hers. Kuchisaki Yona is extremely dangerous and I hope nobody ever sees her. Because in my opinion, she might be the scariest urban legend of all time. Each of these pictures have a backstory that will make you sick to your stomach, part 2. On August 1st, 2009, Delilah Dipolito, who is on the right of this picture, got into the passenger seat of a red sedan for a secret meeting and told the driver she wanted him to kill her husband who was on the left. She offered him 7000 and he responded that he already bought the gun. They agreed on a date and time when she would be at the gym to establish an alibi. When Delilah arrived home after her workout on the day of the planned murder, her house was a crime scene. Police told her that her husband was dead and she broke down in tears right there in the street. Officers consoled her and then took her to the station for a debriefing and explanation. There, she continued to sob in horror and disbelief until the man she believed to be dead came out from behind a doorway. The whole operation had been a setup. The hitman was an undercover cop and her husband himself was in on the sting, with the entire situation being recorded for an episode of Cops. What I'm about to show you is Delilah's reaction coming back from the gym and finding out her husband is dead. Or at least to her, and keep in mind, she orchestrated this whole thing. Just watch her acting here. Listen, we had a report of a disturbance at your house, and there were shots fired. Is your husband Michael? Okay, I'm sorry to tell you, man, he's been killed. No, 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 no. He's, he's been killed, man. No, he's not. Listen, no, no. Try to calm down. No, no. Listen, right now, we'll, no. we need to get you to the no. We need to get you to the police station. No. Bam Margera's uncle is a pedophile. This is the twisted story of Vincent Margera or Don Vito. So Vincent was born in Chester, Pennsylvania, the same small town that a lot of the jackass guys came from. And throughout his life, he held a number of jobs, but he wasn't really publicly seen until Bam got his own show. Now, if you'll remember, Bam Margera is one of the original cast members from Jackass, and his own show, Viva La Bam, featured Don Vito, his uncle. Apparently, the guys on the show called him Don Vito because you could barely tell what he was saying and it reminded them of the guy from The Godfather. So, Don was a really big part of the show. They were making fun of him all the time, playing pranks on him, joking around with him. And Don had a lot of influence behind the scenes. He was also on red carpets, he was at all the premieres, and he even had his own little movie with Ryan Dunn, R.I.P. But on August 18th, 2006, Don Vito, aka Vincent, was arrested at a mall in Colorado on the suspicion of having touched inappropriately two minor girls. So he went through a court process and eventually he was found guilty of two essays on minors, even though one count was dropped. And he was then sentenced to serve 10 years of probation, which once again, I don't think is enough. He was also ordered to never play the character of Don Vito during a sentence. He was given a 10 year probation from playing that character. And in October of 2015, he collapsed in his home was rushed to the hospital and died as a combination of obesity and alcoholism. Basically, all of his internal organs had just failed at the same time. Obviously, I didn't know this about this guy and I cannot believe what I was reading, but it's just another sad story of somebody who, in my opinion, escaped any form of real justice for what they had done. This is the terrifying mystery of the Virginia Tech murders. 
Heidi Childs and David Metzler were childhood sweethearts. They grew up in Virginia and met through a church youth group and were inseparable by the time that they were at Virginia Tech College. Heidi was 18 and on the 26th of August 2009, she was super excited for an appointment the following day with a careers advisor. On the day in question, David had planned something really nice for her. He planned to take her out on a date to a field in Jefferson National Forest. The plan was they were going to hang out and play some music while the sun set. The location he picked is a lovely spot, but the fields are quite secluded. The couple got there at around 8.15 and what happened next is not clear. The following day at 8am, a dog walker found the couple's bodies. David was in the driver's seat of his car and there was glass all over the gravel by the door. He'd been shot. Heidi had also tragically been shot with a hunting rifle and was found outside of the car. Her bag, phone, ID, camera and lanyard were all missing. The first press conference revealed that DNA evidence had been collected, which was believed to be from the killer. There were also six cars identified that police were investigating further. However, tragically, this case has very much gone cold. Many believe that the couple may have stumbled upon something they shouldn't have seen and were then killed to keep them quiet. Another theory is that a poacher may have accidentally shot David and then shot Heidi to cover this up. I recently actually covered the case of the back to school killer, Jesse Matthew, who was actively killing during this period of time in this area. However, this case doesn't seem to match Jesse's typical MO or motive. Unfortunately, this case remains unsolved to this day. This is the shocking UK case that has just come to light of Alex Batty from Oldham. This month, Alex Batty, who went missing aged 11 during a 2017 holiday to Spain, was miraculously found. A student had been making a delivery at 3am in a rural town in France. He suddenly came across a teenager looking dishevelled, walking in the pouring rain. It was pitch black and he knew something was up. The student stopped and struck up a conversation with Alex and as they got talking, Alex's unbelievable story of survival came to light. The student ended up putting Alex's name into Google and realising he'd been missing all of these years. Alex had been trekking for days for over 22 miles. The student let Alex use his phone to send a message to his nan, 68-year-old Susan. Alex tried on multiple different apps to try and get hold of her and wrote, Hello Grandma, it's me Alex, please pick me up. On another app, he wrote, Hello Grandma, it's me Alex, I'm in France, Toulouse, I really hope that you receive this message, I love you and I want to come home. The student dropped him off by a local police station to try and get him some help. Six years earlier, Alex had gone on holiday to Spain with his mum and his granddad. They'd actually taken Alex from his nan who had custody of him. They sent his nan a video at the end of the holiday telling her that they would not be returning him to her. Alex was forced to live in religious communes in remote locations. He'd been named Zach Edwards while living there. He ended up deciding it was no way for him to live and escaping of his own accord. Police are currently hunting his mum Melanie and the granddad. Alex was reunited with his nan and said, when I got back to Manchester, it was raining as usual. I was driven back to my grand's house and I walked in the door and she's in the living room. I started shaking and just gave her a massive hug. Teenager brutally killed this girl and what happened after he was arrested shocked the community. Caitlin Cargill was a 14 year old girl living in Bedford, Texas. It was 2017 and she was living with her mum and pet dog. On the 19th of June, Caitlin had been with another local teenager when she started texting 16-year-old Jordan Roach. They decided to meet him later that afternoon and Caitlin and her friend took the dog to the local park. There they spotted Oak Creek Lane Apartments, which was where Jordan lived. Caitlin left her friend with the dog and went to meet Jordan. However, she then seemingly vanished into thin air. The friend had decided to tie the dog up and play some basketball while she waited for Caitlin to come back. However, unfortunately, she never did and half an hour later, the friend sent a text to Caitlin asking if she was okay. Caitlin's mum reported her missing shortly after this. Police were quick to interview Jordan. He told them though that he'd never actually met her that day. Tragically, just days after she disappeared, Caitlin's body was found. She had been beaten to death with a hammer and put in a landfill. Investigators then looked into where the bins from Oak Creek Lane Apartments had gone. They were able to confirm that the bins had been transported to landfill the day that Caitlin's body was discovered. Then when forensic teams examined Jordan's apartment, they were shocked. Blood spatter was found on the hallway, walls and doors. 
Blood was also found on the kitchen blinds and door handle, and this blood was sent off to be tested. A hammer believed to be the murder weapon was discovered with Jordan's DNA on it. The blood in the apartment was found to be that of Caitlin's. Jordan was arrested and charged with Caitlin's murder, and he was charged as an adult despite being 16 at the time. He would plead guilty to the crime and accepted a plea deal. He was given a shockingly short sentence of just 10 years. This sick woman has been nicknamed the nanny from hell. And the stories of her abuse are sickening. Let me tell you, viewer discretion is heavily advised for this TikTok. So this is Nicole Lynn Walter. She was 27 years old when she was arrested and she's from Florida. And between 2017 and 2018, she abused the children that she was nannying. The kids were only three years old and 15 years old, and she had been charging her clients online different rates, more expensive and less expensive, for the different types of abuse she was carrying out on these kids. Now, when investigators interviewed the three-year-old that Nicole had been nannying, she said that Nicole, her nanny, had been, you know, behaving inappropriately with her, and she told investigators that Nicole had been touchy with her privates. Now, when investigators got a search warrant and executed it on Nicole's home, they found a micro SD card that contained disgusting, according to them, vile images of a minor. Images that Nicole had taken herself. They also found video files on Nicole's computer that showed her completely bare in front of the children that she had been nannying, talking to the kids while she was playing uh, with herself, if you know what I'm talking about. As in, she was toying with herself while she was talking to the kids she was nannying right there on camera. I mean, how disturbing can the story get? When pressed about all this, Nicole told investigators that she recorded, uploaded, and sold this content to clients on the internet who were requesting her to make these sorts of sick and twisted videos. Now, keep in mind, Nicole was also uploading uh, adult videos and images of herself to the internet and charging for them without the kids involved. But like we said at the beginning, if there were kids involved, she would charge clients extra based on what they wanted. So this is a sick story. This is a very sick individual. And this once again goes to show that it's not only men who can be pedophiles, it can be anybody. And sometimes these people don't look at all like what you would expect them to. A man got extremely suspicious texts of his ex before she vanished. Then the house she was last seen in went up in flames. Brooklyn Farthing was an 18-year-old girl living in Berrier, Kentucky. In June 2013, she had graduated from high school and she was excited for the future. She was really talented at doing hair and makeup and her family thinks she potentially wanted to go into hair and beauty. She was incredibly outgoing and was loved by so many. On the 21st of June, Brooklyn and her sister Paige did their driving tests. Brooklyn passed hers, but unfortunately her sister Paige didn't. Later that day, the pair of them went to their granddad's birthday party and the whole family went. Then Brooklyn and Paige went to another party with their cousin. At around 7pm that evening, Brooklyn decided to stay at the party while Paige and the cousin left. It's believed that Brooklyn got into an argument with a friend because the friend wanted to stay at a boy's house. Brooklyn was reportedly seen leaving the party then with two men. This was a guy called Josh Hensley and another unidentified male. It was early in the morning of the 22nd of June that they apparently dropped the unknown male off at his house. Brooklyn and Josh then went back to Josh's place. Strangely, Josh's home had no running water or electrics. At around 4am, Brooklyn had rang her sister to try and get a lift home. However, due to the fact that they'd all been to parties that evening, they were unable to get a lift because the person driving the car had been drinking. Brooklyn then rang her ex and asked if he could come and get her and he agreed to pick her up at around 7am. She then texted, can you hurry, then please hurry, then I'm scared. Around an hour later, she then sent a text saying, never mind, I'm okay, I'm going to a party in Rockcastle County. No one ever heard from her again. There was also no record of this party at Rockcastle County. At around 7am, Josh rang the fire service to report his house being up in flames. He told officers that Brooklyn was inside the house when the fire began. The fire service found that actually the only area that was burnt was the sofa and the area around it. Brooke and her phone were nowhere to be seen. Josh had told police that he'd popped out to check on his horses and when he came back, the fire had begun. Two days later, Brooklyn's phone pinged off a tower in Blue Lick for the last time. Now, disgustingly, Josh was later arrested for possessing CSA images. Brooklyn's case remains unsolved and her family have no closure or justice in this case. This is the sinkhole incident, one of the worst deaths imaginable explained. This was Jeffrey Bush who lived in Florida, and he lived in a home with his brother, his sister-in-law, and his niece. The house was built in the 1970s and there was never any indication that there was anything wrong with the house. 
But on the night of February 28th, 2013, Jeffrey Bush was sleeping in his room when all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, Jeffrey's brother Jeremy heard his brother screaming. They heard him screaming for help and also heard some really loud crashing noises. And when Jeremy got to the room and looked inside, Jeffrey was gone. His bed was gone, his dresser was gone, his TV was gone. Because a massive sinkhole opened up in Jeffrey's room and swallowed everything inside. At the time, Jeremy said the sinkhole was about 20 feet wide and roughly 6 to 7 feet deep. And Jeremy, not thinking of anything, just jumped into the hole to see if he could find his brother. He said he thought he heard his brother calling his name and screaming for help, but he couldn't actually see Jeffrey anywhere. It was just a dark chasm with Jeffrey's furniture and water pouring in everywhere. Within minutes, firefighters and rescue workers were there. And because sinkholes are so unpredictable, the rescuers just pulled Jeremy out immediately. And they all then left the house. In fact, the sinkhole was still crumbling. The first thing the rescue team did was get a microphone and put it onto a string, and they then put it into the sinkhole to see if they could hear any sounds of life. But they didn't hear a thing. But as they were doing this, the sinkhole collapsed again, and at that point it spread to be about 30 feet wide and about 20 feet deep, which is just crazy. There was no safe way of trying to see if they can even save Jeffrey Bush's life or recover a body if he was dead. I don't know and they don't know how long he survived, but based on the fact that he was screaming for help means he was likely alive for a few minutes before being crushed to death or suffocating. It was literally impossible to get his body. They then tore down the home and built a fence around where the sinkhole is and then poured it with a bunch of asphalt burying Jeffrey forever. They also said there's a slim chance his body could get picked up by a nearby waterway, but it's extremely unlikely. Two years later, the sinkhole reopened and they then had to demolish all the homes around it. This death is absolutely terrifying and made Jeffrey Bush rest in peace. This little boy went missing six years ago, but he was just found alive walking down a dark road in France. This story is actually insane. This is Alex Batty. He was 11 years old when he went missing during what was supposed to be a two-week family vacation to Spain, but the details surrounding his disappearance are odd. In 2017, Alex was living with his grandma, who was his legal guardian in Oldham, England. His dad left when he was two years old, and ever since, he was raised by his mom, Melanie, and his grandma, who eventually took over guardianship. Alex's grandma agreed agreed to let him go on a vacation with his mom and grandpa to Spain, but that was six years ago, and that was the last time that she ever saw him. His disappearance became widely known, but there was literally no trace of him. But just last week, Alex, who was now 17, was found walking down the road in the middle of the night near the city of Toulouse in France. A delivery driver spotted him walking alone in the rain with a flashlight, backpack, and skateboard, and he offered him a ride. Alex agreed, and once he got in the car, he initially gave the driver a fake name, but ultimately he told him that his real name was Alex. Alex Batty and that he was kidnapped by his mom five years ago in Morocco. Alex told him that he had walked for four days and four nights through the rugged Pyrenees, sleeping in the light and hiking in the dark, trying to get to a big city to seek out authorities. He said that to survive, he ate what he could find in fields and gardens. He then stated that he'd been living a nomadic lifestyle in Spain, Morocco, and most recently France with his mom and grandpa as part of a spiritual community. He said that they would never stay in one place for too long, would grow their own food, they meditated, and contemplated reincarnation. According to Alex, he carpooled with a community of about 10 people doing odd jobs to get by, and they would carry solar panels with them for energy. It was only after his mom said that she wanted everyone to move to Finland that Alex decided he wanted to leave the group. He told the driver that picked him up that he had had enough and that he was 17 and needed a future, but that he couldn't see a future there. The driver took him to the police after looking him up online and finding out that he was indeed a missing child. Authorities then notified Alex's grandma that he was found, which she's obviously very excited about. According to her, Alex disappeared in 2017 because of disagreements over his care and the fact that his mom and grandpa were interested in pursuing an alternative lifestyle with him. Alex told authorities that he was never physically abused, but that he had not attended school in the past six years, and he was reportedly in good health when he was found. Alex has since been reunited with his grandma. As for his mom, Melanie, she is currently wanted by British police in connection to his disappearance, and she may be in Finland. His grandpa, David, is believed to have died about six months ago. Manchester police are still investigating the circumstances around Alex's disappearance and whether or not there should be a criminal investigation. What do you guys think about this case? This is the skydiving incident, one of the worst deaths imaginable explained. This is 18-year-old Tyler Turner who just graduated high school. 
In 2016, Tyler and a group of his friends wanted to experience a thrill. So they all decided to go skydiving for the first time. And unfortunately for Tyler, it would be his first and his last. This was a video taken moments before Tyler went skydiving. My name is Tyler Turner. What day I do? Yeah, I am gonna jump out of a plane. It's your first time. First time indeed. His mom, Francine, was there to see him all. That's my mom. Ah. Hello, very loving mom. Don't want me to leave my life. Or that you'll have more of my life. Because I'm gonna make it. <laughs> that video is the final time Tyler would ever talk to his mom. The plane went up in the air and one by one, people were jumping out of it. Tyler would be doing a tandem skydive with this instructor. Later, it would come out that he wasn't even certified and all of his documents were forged. Tyler's mother was waiting 13,000 feet below waiting for her son to come down. Tyler and his instructor jumped out of the plane and all his mother really could see is just tiny dots in the sky. But the more and more people that come down, she still hasn't seen her son. As Tyler and his instructor were coming down to the earth, the worst possible thing happened. The instructor pulled the ripcord, but the parachute didn't come out. The backup parachutes didn't work either. All of the parachutes failed. And I could assume when this happened, both of them started to panic. They were falling at roughly 200 feet per second, which is insane. And that means without a parachute, it would take 70 to 80 seconds to fall down to the earth which for them, I imagine, felt like hours and hours. And all while this is happening, Tyler's mother is still looking up in the air, waiting for her son. And because of the freefall aspect, they have gone off course. So they were no longer falling in the exact area they were supposed to. About a minute to a minute and a half later, after they jumped out of the plane, and at roughly 100 to 120 miles per hour, they crashed into the earth. I couldn't find any autopsy report about their death, but all I could hope is they had some sort of heart failure before they hit the ground, because experiencing that must be absolutely horrific. Tyler's mother filed a lawsuit against the skydiving company and she won $40 million for her son's death. But sadly, she is forever without her son. This is just so sad because before Tyler went skydiving, he literally said in the video that he was scared and he hopes he makes it. And his mother was there when this all happened. I can't imagine the pain she was feeling and made Tyler Turner rest in peace. Family of this deceased woman continued to get texts off her after she died. Monica Moynan was a 22 year old mother of two from North Carolina. She was living in Holly Springs in April 2019 when she vanished. She had a boyfriend at the time, 44 year old Brian Sluss, who was the father of her two children. It was quite normal for Monica to speak to her mum on the phone every couple of weeks, so her mum started to get a little concerned when she hadn't heard from her via the phone. The only thing she was receiving were text messages. Between April and June that year, she was only able to communicate with Monica via text. This was unusual as they, as I said, did regular voice calls. In July, someone else raised a concern. Monica's apartment manager had actually rang Monica's mum to express concern about her whereabouts. They'd only seen Brian at the apartments rather than Monica. It sparked their suspicions and they raised a call with police to do a welfare check. Police tried to locate Monica but failed to do so. She was recorded as a missing person. Brian was confronted by police who wanted to know when he'd last seen her. He was adamant that he'd seen her in June but he said she had addiction issues and had run away. At this point, Brian made a worrying confession. He claimed that he'd been sending texts pretending to be Monica, and he did this because he didn't want to worry Monica's mum. He said he couldn't bear to tell her that Monica had addiction issues and had run away of her own accord. Then there was even more cause for concern. Police searched Monica's apartment and found evidence that a clean-up had occurred. Floor tiles had been removed and forensics experts took a closer look. They found that human blood had been cleaned from in between the tiles. They sent off swabs to the lab and found the blood was a match for Monica. Police also found evidence that Monica could have been pregnant at the time that she vanished. Now we know statistically being pregnant makes you more likely to be killed at the hands of a partner. Brian and his ex-wife Jarlin were named as persons of interest. In 2020, Brian was charged with Monica's murder. Jarlin was also charged with obstruction of justice and accessory to the murder after the fact. Brian defended himself in the murder trial and claimed she left of her own accord and denied any knowledge of what happened. However, it was also revealed in court that Brian used Monica's phone and created Facebook pages for her under her name. He also sent texts to her family to try and keep up the pretense that she was still alive. 
The shocked jurors were then shown horrific footage of Brian punching his four-year-old child. This footage was captured on a nanny cam. He was found guilty of first degree murder with special circumstances of DV. Monica's body has still never been found. Brian was given life in prison. This true crime case will make your blood boil. Over a decade ago, 19 year old Cara Nichols vanished. The teenager was born and raised in Colorado Springs and unfortunately had begun using substances throughout high school. She was reported missing on the 14th of October, 2012. At this point, her roommates hadn't heard from her for five days. Police soon learned that she'd actually spoken to her brother on the phone on the 9th of October at around 11.45 p.m. She told him that she was on her way to a modeling shoot. The next day, unsettlingly, her phone was going straight to answer phone. It was actually her brother that ended up traveling to her apartment to figure out what was going on. He spoke to her roommates and the alarm was raised. Now, Cara's laptop was actually still at her apartment, which was concerning because if she just decided to up and left, she wouldn't have left her laptop behind. When investigators started digging into the case, they found that Cara had been placing ads as an S worker. Interestingly, she'd actually posted an ad with her phone number on it the same day she went missing. Police also found out that her phone had been used on that day too at almost midnight. Investigators started looking into exactly which numbers she'd received calls from and set about contacting the individuals. They got a return call of Joel Hollendorfer. He admitted to police that yes, he had spoke to the girl about S services, but they'd never ended up meeting. However, when police tracked Kara's phone, her last activity was in the area of Joel's parents' house. Police ended up searching at the property with a cadaver dog. Disturbingly, the dog barked in loads of different areas on the property to indicate remains. However, the owner of the property stated that this must be just because they have a lot of animals and over the years the animals die and then they bury them in the back garden. The police were happy with this explanation and gave up on the search. They also though decided to interview Joel's wife, who strangely declined to cooperate with the investigation. Frustratingly, Kara's case went cold. On February the 8th, 2022, a decade after she went missing, police confirmed that they had found Kara's body. It was on that property they'd searched the whole time. Joel was obviously arrested. In February 2022, his wife decided to come clean to police. She told them that Joel had told her in 2014 that he accidentally killed an escort that he'd hired. He admitted that he accidentally strangled her to death and buried her near a dead horse on the property. Joel's defence in court claimed that he accidentally killed her in an S act gone wrong and that she lost consciousness due to substance use. Shockingly, he was only convicted of manslaughter and got just 24 years in prison. This was a huge blow to Kara's family. <coughs> These two 12 year old girls tried to stab and kill their friend in the name of Slender Man. This is the story of the Slender Man stabbing and viewer discretion is advised. This is a disturbing tale. So meet Anissa Wire and Morgan Geyser. These two 12 year old girls are from Wisconsin. And growing up, they were obsessed with the character of Slender Man. Now, if you don't know who Slender Man is, he is a fictional character that supposedly targets children, and he oftentimes hides out in forests. As a child, Morgan Geyser pictured here had exhibited strange behaviors. She frequently hallucinated, claimed that she was seeing colors melting down walls and ghosts in her house, and eventually she became, along with her best friend Anissa, obsessed with the tale of Slender Man. Now, these are some drawings taken from Morgan's notebook that investigators eventually recovered, but they were obsessed with Slenderman. Morgan drew him on every page in the book. She depicted Slenderman loving and hugging her. And it was apparent that the two girls were obsessed with the mythology behind this fake character. Now, Morgan and Anissa were great friends with Peyton pictured right here, but Peyton wasn't in on the Slenderman thing. And eventually the two girls got convinced that they needed to appease Slenderman somehow. And how did Slender Man want to be appeased? Well, with a blood sacrifice of their friend. So on May 31st, 2014, Morgan and Anissa lured Peyton out to the middle of the woods. They said that they wanted to play a game of hide and seek, but what Peyton didn't know was that they were planning on murdering her. 
So Morgan and Anissa had brought things to the woods with them, including a knife. And when they got out to a super secluded area, they pinned Peyton down and stabbed her 19 times. Keep in mind, these are 12 year old girls we're talking about. They stabbed her in the arms, leg and torso and punctured her liver and stomach. These two girls then told their friend that they would leave her to go find some help after attacking her, but they left the woods and left her for dead. Apparently, these two were convinced that after they murdered their friend, a portal would open up in the middle of the forest, Slenderman would come out and he would take them to Slenderman's mansion. But obviously, they never found Slenderman and they were eventually found by the police. You see, Peyton being as strong as she had, even after being stabbed 19 times, got up and dragged herself to a nearby road where she was discovered by a cyclist. Now, when people found out the details behind this crime, this was a national news story. It was so incredibly shocking. Two young girls trying to curry the favor of Slenderman had stabbed their friend almost to death. But even though they thought they had murdered their friend Peyton, she was still alive. Now, eventually, Morgan was given a 40 years to life prison sentence, and she is serving that out at a mental institution. She was also given three years minimum in locked solitary confinement. And shockingly, Anissa was just released in 2021. She's on probation right now, but she's out living her life wherever she is. There's so much more to this story, but it's just shocking how two 12 year old girls could actually target their best friend, their, the third member of their group, and stab her and leave her to die in the middle of the woods. I mean, I don't think I've ever heard a story quite like this. And if you want to hear more true crime stories, be sure to check out the podcast that my wife and I co-host called Murder in America, available on all streaming platforms. Out of all of the kidnapping cases, this one absolutely shocked me. Mary Vincent ran away from home when she was 15. She was born in Vegas, but ran away to Sao Salito in California with her boyfriend. The two didn't really have much of a plan and they ended up living in a car. Soon though, Mary was completely on her own when her boyfriend was arrested for aring a different teenager. In September 1978, she attempted to hitchhike to her granddad's house. He lived in Corona and it was due to be a huge 400 mile trip. She needed a reliable and helpful member of the public to help take her at least some of the way. That's when she came across a seemingly helpful older man called Lawrence Singleton. He pulled over and offered the young girl a lift. She accepted this, but it wouldn't be long before she would massively regret that decision. During the car journey, Lawrence put his hand on Mary's neck to apparently check whether she was well. Soon after this, she fell asleep. Now, when she woke, she was alarmed because she realized they were going in the opposite direction than she wanted. She realized something was wrong and there was actually a sharp stick in the car, so she used this to threaten Lawrence. He claimed this had just been a mistake and agreed to turn back around and go the right way. However, when they decided to pull over for a toilet break, things would take a very dark turn. Lawrence used this opportunity to strike Mary over the head and start to strangle her. He awed the teenager before tying her hands behind her back and driving on. When they came to a stop, he forced her to drink an unknown liquid and she begged for him to let her go. He callously said, you want to be free, I'll set you free. What he did next was absolutely hideous. He took out a hatchet and sliced off both of the girl's arms. He stated, okay, now you're free. He fled the scene and essentially left her there to die. Incredibly though, Mary found some inner strength and managed to drag herself out of the canyon. Losing a lot of blood as she walked, she actually went three miles and held what was essentially left of her arms above her head to stop her losing too much blood. Luckily, after the three mile walk, a car did stop and took her immediately to hospital. She had life-saving surgery and was fitted with prosthetic arms. She obviously needed a huge amount of physio and counselling to cope with the both physical and mental trauma. Luckily, Mary was able to provide a massive amount of information to police about her attacker and he was soon arrested. Shockingly though, this story only gets worse. Although he was found guilty of our kidnap and attempted murder, he served just eight years in prison. Having left Mary to die, he was then let out of prison on good behaviour. This would prove to be a fatal decision and he would go on to commit an even more hideous crime. On February the 19th, 1997, he was living in Florida and decided to lure an S worker, Roxanne Hayes, into his house. After suddenly hearing blood curdling screams, neighbors alerted authorities. However, when they arrived, it was too late. Roxanne's body lay on the floor. Lawrence had stabbed her to death. 
This time he was sentenced to death, but he actually ended up dying of cancer while on death row. Mary founded the Mary Vincent Foundation to help survivors of violent crimes. A Christmas massacre that left 14 members of this man's family dead. Ronald Jean Simmons remains the most prolific serial killer in the history of Arkansas. Back in 1957, Ronald dropped out of school and joined the Navy. It was there that he met his wife, Becky, and they had seven children together. In 1981, the family were forced to flee to Pope County in Arkansas after allegations that Ronald had fathered a child with his oldest daughter, Sheila, who he'd been abusing for years. Eventually, Sheila went on to move out, as did her brother, Billy, as they started families of their own. By December 1987, Ronald had been fired from a number of jobs and for some unknown reason, he decided to kill his whole family. Exactly 36 years ago today, on December 22nd, 1987, 47-year-old Ronald began his killing spree. First, he bludgeoned his wife and oldest son, Jean, to death with a crowbar. He also shot them. He then strangled his three-year-old granddaughter and dumped the three bodies in a cesspit in the garden, which he'd forced his children to dig. He then sat and waited for three of his other children to come home from school. He welcomed them into the house, saying that he had Christmas presents for them, but he wanted to give them one at a time. He first killed his 17-year-old daughter, Loretta, by strangling her and then holding her head underwater in a rain barrel. Eddie, 14, Marianne, 11, and Becky, 8, were then killed in the same way. He then dumped all four bodies in the cesspit. He spent the next four days in the house, only leaving to go to a local bar. And then, on Boxing Day, he awaited the arrival of his two oldest children, Sheila and Billy, and their families. When they arrived, Billy and his wife, Renata, were shot dead. And Ronald then killed their one-year-old son, Trey, by strangling him. He then shot his daughter, Sheila, and also strangled his seven-year-old daughter who he'd fathered with Sheila. Sheila's husband, Dennis, was also shot and killed, and Ronald then shot his one-year-old grandson, Michael. He laid all the bodies out in the living room and covered them with coats and the family's best tablecloth. But Ronald wasn't finished with his killing spree. He then drove to a law firm where he'd met 24-year-old Kathy. She was the secretary there and Ronald had become infatuated with her, but she'd rejected him. He walked in, pointed the gun at her and pulled the trigger, killing her. He then went to an oil firm where he intended to kill the owner, Russell Taylor. He walked in and shot Russell, injuring him. He then shot and killed another man in the building who was a complete stranger. He then went to a mini-mart where he shot two people, injuring them. And then finally, he went to a motor freight company where he shot his former supervisor, injuring her. The police were called and Ronald handed over his gun and he was arrested. Ronald was sentenced to death for the 16 murders that he committed and he chose lethal injection as the method for his execution. On June 25th, 1990, Ronald Jean Simmons Sr. was executed. None of his surviving relatives would claim the body, so he was buried in a potter's field, otherwise known as a pauper's grave, in Lincoln County, Arkansas. The Junko Furuta case is, in my opinion, the most horrific murder to happen in Japan. What happened to this girl is horrifying in every sense of the word. For those that haven't heard of this case, just a quick trigger warning. Some of the details are horrific and quite graphic. In fact, some of it's that bad, I've had to leave it out of the video. On November 25th, 1988, Junko was riding her bike home from work. She was just 17 years old at the time. There were two teenage boys aged 16 and 18 wandering the streets at that time with the intentions of robbing and raping local women. They spotted Junko and came up with a plan. One of them hid while the other one went over to Junko and kicked her off her bike. He ran off and the other one came out of hiding and pretended to go to Junko's aid. He picked her up onto her feet and said that he'd walk her home. Junko had absolutely no idea that these two boys were working together to abduct her. She was taken to a warehouse where she was raped. She was then taken to a park where she was raped again. The two boys then called two of their friends and the four of them took Junko to a house where one of the boys lived with his parents. They told Junko that they knew where she lived and if she tried to run, 
they'd kill her whole family. They'd been that violent towards her up until then that she had absolutely no doubts in her mind that they would do what they said. Junko was forced to call her parents a number of times and tell them that she was perfectly fine and she was just staying with friends so that nobody would start looking for her. One of the details in this case that I find absolutely shocking is this boy's parents were home most of the time. They knew exactly what was going on with Junko and they did nothing to stop it. They later said that they didn't stop it because they were scared of their son. Junko was held captive in that house for 44 days and just a quick trigger warning again, I will describe what happened to Junko, but it is graphic. Junko was regularly gang raped by multiple people that these boys would invite to the house. She was forced to inhale paint thinner. She had her arms and legs burned with lighter fluid. She was repeatedly essayed with objects such as metal rods, lit matches and glass bottles. She was starved and eventually became so weak that she couldn't move off the bedroom floor. Her face was swollen and many of her burns and injuries had become infected and started to rot. On January 4th, 1989, Junko was set on fire with lighter fluid. She did attempt to put out the flames, but became unconscious. These four boys continued to abuse Junko as she lay there dying. They punched her, kicked her, poured candle wax onto her eyelids. They dropped an exercise ball on her stomach multiple times and held her hands to the floor and dropped dumbbells on them. This attack lasted a total of two hours and Junko eventually succumbed to her injuries and died. Junko's body was then wrapped in blankets, put inside this metal drum, which was then filled with wet concrete and dumped inside a cement truck. While Junko was being held in captivity, two of these boys had actually gone out and raped another girl. They were identified and the police came to question them. One of them thought that they'd been rumbled and he confessed to the murder of Junko and he told police where to find her body. Junko was identified using her fingerprints and these boys were all arrested along with everybody else that took part in the abuse. The four boys all pleaded guilty to committing bodily injury that resulted in death, not murder, and they were sentenced to between 5 and 20 years. Absolutely shocking sentences for such a horrific crime, and all four of them are now free. I've detailed their names, ages, and the sentences that they all got. If anybody's interested in reading, it's in the caption. Three different family members took their own lives inside of this house decades apart from each other. And that's why people think this might be the most haunted house in America. Welcome to the Lemp Mansion in St. Louis, Missouri. The story of this house is incredibly disturbing, filled with tragedy and sadness, and it's one of the most interesting stories behind a haunted house that I've ever learned about. So this is William Lemp Sr. He came to St. Louis and took over the operations of the Western Brewery. He grew the brewery to a massive proportion and renamed it the Lemp Brewery. The Lemp Mansion itself was built over a network of underground caves that was used by the brewers. And if you know anything about St. Louis, Missouri, the place is a brewery town. It's the birthplace of Anheuser-Busch, who produces Bud Light, Budweiser. And for years, the Lemp Brewery, which was owned and operated by the Lemp family who lived here in the Lemp Mansion, was the biggest brewery in St. Louis. But as time went on, William Lemp Sr.'s health began to decline. His youngest son, Frederick Lemp, died suddenly and tragically from a heart condition. And soon afterwards, William Lemp Sr. headed upstairs in the Lemp Mansion, took out a pistol, and took his own life inside of the house. William was only the first of three men from the Lemp family who would take their own lives inside of the home in the same manner. So after William Lemp Sr. took his own life in the mansion, William Lemp Jr., aka Billy Lemp, took over the entire brewing operation. But just years after taking the reins of the business, the Prohibition era started. When was a time in America, if you don't remember, when alcohol was completely illegal? This caused the brewery to shut down and shattered Billy's dreams. Just a few years later, in what is now the front left dining room of the building in Billy's old office, Billy took a pistol and ended his own life, just like his dad had done in the same house years prior. This was all shocking already, a father and son taking their own lives in the same house in the same manner a decade or so apart from each other. And already the Lent Mansion began to take on a haunted reputation. 
People who visited the mansion, even in that time period, claimed that they saw the spirits of Billy and William floating throughout the home. They didn't know what they wanted, but they wanted something. And let me tell you, the interior of this house is exactly like you would expect it would look. It is very creepy, it is very haunted looking, and it just looks like a place where you would see a ghost. We can't move on in the story without mentioning Elsa Lemp, Billy Lemp's sister. Now, Elsa was the daughter of William Lemp Sr., who, if you'll remember, took his own life with a pistol, and the sister of Billy Lemp, who also took his own life with a pistol. Well, two years before Billy took his own life, Elsa also took her own life with a pistol. But she just didn't do it inside of the Lemp mansion. She did it in her own home. People still don't know if she actually took her own life or if she was murdered, but it was another tragedy that struck the Lemp family. Now, with the brewery being shuttered, with three Lemps having taken their own lives, the Lemp family seemed to be cursed and locals in St. Louis began to speak of a Lemp family curse. But after Elsa and Billy Lemp's tragic deaths, it seemed like the curse had been broken. But years later, that tragic curse would strike again. This is Charles Lemp, William Lemp Sr.'s third son. Before the Lemp Brewery was shuttered, Charles Lemp had actually left the family business and went into the world of banking. He dabbled in politics, made a fortune, and he lived in the Lemp Mansion with his dog and two servants. No, he never married, but he was a rich man who seemingly lived a happy life. But in the year 1949, 27 years after his own brother Billy Lemp had taken his own life in the Lemp Mansion, Charles Lemp penned a note that said, If I am found dead, blame it on nobody but myself. And he then took a pistol and took his own life in the same house. So if you're keeping track now, that is three members of the Lemp family who took their own lives with pistols inside of the Lemp Mansion and a daughter of the family who took her own life with a pistol in a different location. Now, obviously, this is a massive reason why people think that the Lemp family mansion is haunted. In fact, the Lemp mansion is routinely named as one of the most haunted houses in America. People see all the members of the Lemp family floating throughout the home. They'll hear screaming, they'll hear echoing of gunshots, and oftentimes people just get really bad vibes inside of the house. And there's other history that haunts this home. There's the story of a young deformed boy that was forced to live in the attic, never to be seen by the public, who was beaten to death by one of his parents. And let me tell you, staying overnight in the mansion completely alone, I can tell you that this place is 100% haunted. When I stayed there, before we had even started ghost hunting, we heard the sounds of somebody screaming from the bottom floor of the home. In my video that I posted on YouTube, this is the very first minute of the video before we had even started filming, like I said, we got out our iPhones and went to investigate and found that, yeah, there was nobody there. All the doors were locked. We were the only people in the mansion. And this ended up being such a freaky place that I couldn't even sleep with the door locked. I had to barricade my door shut with a chair. I know that sounds wimpy, but that's how scary it was. And that's how present the negative energy is inside of that historic mansion. So if you want to watch the full-length documentary that I filmed about the Lemp Mansion, it's on my YouTube channel, The Paranormal Files Now. We had full access to every single room in the house. We interviewed people that had worked there for years. And like I said, we slept there and spent the night ghost hunting. It is one of the scariest things I've ever done. And if you like spooky stuff, I highly recommend that you go check that video out. House of one of the most horrific murders is set to be demolished at the end of this month before a trial has even taken place. And if you think that that's a horrible decision, there's now a petition that you can sign to hopefully stop that from happening. The demolition of 1122 King Road is set to begin on December 28th. It's the off-campus rental home in Moscow, Idaho, where four University of Idaho students were brutally stabbed to death in the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022. The victims were roommates Kaylee Gonzalez, her childhood best friend Madison Mogan, Zana Carnodal, and her boyfriend Ethan Chapin, who happened to be staying the night with her that night. Brian Koberger, who was at the time studying for his PhD in criminology at Washington State University, was arrested and charged with the murders six weeks later at his family's home in Pennsylvania. This demolition date comes less than a year after Brian's arrest and before a trial date has even been set. It was just released that prosecutors are now asking for the trial date to be set sometime in the summer of 2024. But as of right now, no official trial date has been set. As far as the demolition, there are many people, including some of the victims' families, that think this is a horrible idea. The King Roadhouse was donated to the University of Idaho earlier this year, and according to the school, they want the house to be torn down before students arrive back to the campus in hopes of trying to move on. The president of the school has recently released this statement, saying, quote, It is a grim reminder of the heinous act that took place there. While we appreciate the emotional connection that some family members of the victims may have to this house, it's time for its removal and to allow the collective healing of our community to continue, end quote. 
A memorial garden titled Vandal Healing Garden and Memorial is planned to take the place of the crime scene and is currently being designed by architecture students at the university. But many professionals, as well as some of the victim's family members, question why they would tear down the house and destroy the single most important piece of evidence before the trial has even started. Most understand that the house is an eyesore, but walking the jury through the crime scene is extremely important and it gives them a perspective that photos just can't do. Although the FBI and Brian Koberger's lawyers have returned to the house multiple times to take photos and create 3D maps of the house, some argue that it would severely hinder the outcome of this case without the jury even having the option to walk through the crime scene. The family of Kaylee Gonzalez recently posted this on their Facebook page in regards to the news about the demolition, and they've also shared the exact petition, so I'll include that in my bio as well. Along with that, their attorney released this statement on Friday, which is very powerful. I won't read all of this for you, you can pause to read if you need to, but I do want to read the parts that stand out to me and that everyone should hear. Their attorney states, quote, Let us ask this. Isn't it better to have the King Roadhouse and not need it than need the house and not have it? It is obvious from the two recent visits to the house by both the prosecution and the defense that there is still evidentiary value in having the King Road House still standing. The family has stressed tirelessly the importance that the King Road House carries, but nobody seems to care enough. It's like screaming into a void. Victims' families have a voice, and they should be heard and listened to. End quote. Like I said, I've linked the petition in my bio, but I really urge all of you to please go and sign it. I don't know exactly what the outcome will be, but the least we can do is stand with the victim's families and support them on this. To recap the case, in the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022, one of the surviving roommates on the second floor, who I'll refer to as DM, woke up around 4 a.m. and heard what sounded like Kaylee playing with her dog Murphy in one of the bedrooms on the third floor of the house. DM heard who she thought was Kaylee yelling, someone's here, and a short while later, she heard crying coming from Anna's room, which was just down the hall from her on the second floor. DM then heard a man's voice saying, quote, it's okay, I'm going to help you, end quote. And when she opened her bedroom door, she saw a tall man with bushy eyebrows dressed in all black and wearing a mask leave through the sliding glass door of the house. Police were called the next day around noon. Maddie and Kaylee were found deceased, both in Maddie's bed on the third floor, while Ethan and Zana were both found in her room on the second floor. They all suffered multiple stab wounds, and at least two of the victims had severe defensive wounds. From this, investigators pieced together DNA evidence, cell phone data, and surveillance footage that they say links Brian Koberger to the murders. The DNA evidence comes from a knife sheath found under Maddie's body that showed a statistical match with a cheek swab taken directly from Brian after his arrest. Brian's white Hyundai Elantra was also caught on surveillance footage driving by the victim's homes three times before finally parking outside of the victim's homes at 4.04 the morning of the murders. Authorities traced the car back to Pullman, Washington, where it was identified as belonging to Brian. Along with that, Brian's cell phone pinged in the vicinity of the King Road home 12 times prior to the murders, as far back as August, and then once again the morning after the murders. But while his phone did ping in the area before and after the murders, it was turned off from 2.47 to 4.48 a.m., leaving those hours during the murders technically unaccounted for. His alibi, if you can even call it that, was that he just likes to drive around a lot, and that specific night, he was just out driving alone. According to Kaylee's dad, before the gag order earlier this year, one of the lead investigators on the case told them that they believed Brian had been scouting out the house. The murder weapon, which is reportedly a K-bar knife, has never been recovered. But according to now unsealed search warrant documents, investigators combed through Brian's record of Amazon purchases and basically anything pertaining to knives and similar accessories. And if prosecutors can somehow link Brian to the purchase of a K-bar knife possibly used in the quadruple murder, it could significantly help their case. Brian has since been charged with four counts of first-degree murder and one count of burglary, and Lataw County intends to seek the death penalty. So, like I said, prosecutors are now requesting that the trial begin sometime in the summer of 2024, but as of this point, a trial date has not been set. But whenever this case does go to trial, the courtroom will host a live stream which will be available on its YouTube channel. Justice for Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, Zana Hernodal, and Ethan Chapin.